So uh, it appears that we are going live right now and earlier it hadn't gone live. So I'm just going to reorient myself and start all over again. A very happy and warm good evening to all of you. My name is Jyoti Bejwada and I represent Goethe Zentrum Hyderabad. We are, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the one of the art institutes in Hyderabad, a cultural institute, which are happy to bring this conglomeration of German language and culture to Hyderabad. And as a part of our uh, of the kind of work that we do, we support photography, women's events, environment, and these are our focus. Um, as a part of our Women's March this year, which is a month-long program dedicated to women, we had approached Koeli for her exit for an exhibition that she she was happy to bring to us. It was called "Cooking Up a Storm: Her Sojourn," which is still online. And um, this event today, which is an all-women curator panel from from curators across the world, which Koeli Ma'am has kindly put together is called um, am i audible hello? Hello, hello, hello yes sorry sorry again for that uh, uh, technical glitch so yeah, as as i was as i was saying this is uh, we are happy to bring in all uh, to bring this event online and this this uh, panel called the impact of pan of the pandemic on art making and curation kindly brought together by koili mukherjee ma'am thank you all so much for being here with us from different time zones across the world without taking much of your time i'd like to introduce koili who will be the moderator for today's session um, she is a gold medalist in the history of art director at the CRIA, which is the Center for International Arts and Crafts, WISAC, and the office is at Hyderabad. She's an APEX committee member of the NGM in New Delhi, and she was also a former committee member for the physical verification and documentation works of art in the collection of Lalit Kala Academy, New Delhi. She's an artist herself, and I myself have witnessed the beauty of the collections that she presents, which are now across the country in several collections and overseas. At the present, she's doing a private research on the iconic calligraphy work by Parameshwar Raju in Hyderabad that is soon to be published. Koili ma'am, a very warm welcome from us. Thank you so much for doing all that you have done. I will, during the course of this panel discussion, also present the links to all the exhibitions that you have curated for us virtually this year. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. That was a very generous introduction. I really feel very touched. Good evening and welcome. All of you are expert panelists, the chair Amta Desai and uh, team Gotha Centrum, and our viewers from across the globe to this very important panel discussion during COVID time since 2020. From lockdowns and social distancing, lack of opportunities for work, clamp down on sales, migrating from place of work, not being able to get to the studio, survival problems, and fear from the illness looming large as a reality. In this context, I wish to share the journey of Sorano, a Puerto Rican artist who was working in New York for three decades he had to leave his paintings on a dumpster on the street and left the country and returned to Puerto Rico. And uh, some people who were just passing by, they uh, saw the collection and uh, one, one girl who had just lost her job picked up a, a painting that she liked and she said that was the high point of her uh, pandemic experience. And uh, he had also some uh, James Brown a painting that was founded by people who really appreciated the work and they reached out to him. And uh, while Sorano would uh, return back to New York sometime later when uh, uh, the lockdown and the pandemic has sort of settled down, I'm sure there are many who got help like him. And there are many who are struggling to do any work or even survive. 
in 2021, we see that the second wave is around and there are further lockdowns in many parts of the world. We needed to know how are artists everywhere adapting to this very, very hard time. How do we move on with our work, create and showcase? Are there any alternative platforms? How would the creative professionals reshape their priorities? I thank Amita and both his interim team for this opportunity to be able to connect and seek answers and see for ourselves the transformations and opportunities uh, available out there. I wish to introduce our first panelist, Azumi Uchitani from the Netherlands. She's the founder of Japanese Salon Art and Culture Educator, entrepreneur, public speaker, and writer. Our second panelist is Georgina Maddox from India, New Delhi. She's critic, curator, and visual artist. Now I come to Subhashri Biswas Franceski from Denmark. She's an educator, sustainability practitioner, designer, visual artist, and visual researcher. Finally, Cheryl Oring from United States of America, professor and chair, James Pearson Duffy, Department of Art and Art History, Wayne State University. My first question would be to Azumi. Yes. Uh, I wish to know that how did the pandemic uh, impact your work? And well, uh, how did you adapt uh, to it? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, I have uh, many different roles uh, as a professional. And I bridge between Japan and Europe, between Japan, uh, West and East. And in business, culture, art, and spirituality. So in these four different uh, uh, areas, um, I have different roles in one foot in the corporate world and one foot in art and culture. And Japanese alone, it is uh, about art and culture and spirituality. So, um, well, of course, as you may, as you, all of us have uh, 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 faced, uh, we cannot actually hold physical activity and uh, for me it was uh, to create a place to bring people together and bring people to experience really to activate our five senses so that has been um, a challenge so what i started was uh, you know to bring the message uh, to people and the audience and now not only physically here but uh, on the on online uh, platform on YouTube, I started uh, um, um, series of talks, like five minutes on Japanese wisdom. And also for the uh, wider audience, I started giving um, like uh, uh, spiritual um, uh, workshop uh, to the United States, uh, Canada, uh, UK. So more like towards the uh, global audience. So one door closed, the physical door closed, but another door opened. So that I also helped the museum to, especially to bridge the, uh, this gap of what we cannot do. We cannot travel to meet the sponsors. And the, but what we were able to do was to create something variable uh, remotely to the, uh, their sponsors. Thank you very much, uh, Asumi. Uh, my uh, second question would be to Georgina, and uh, I wish to know how is the art community responding to the challenge of change, Georgina? You've been very, all of you, all the panelists have been very resilient in doing what they do during this very, very difficult time. So, a uh, very big hand to you. Uh, and also, um, I mean, uh, the other day you were sharing uh, uh, a few uh, uh, curations that you have been doing during this time. Uh, I'm very uh, curious to know and uh, our viewers would also sort of uh, are looking forward to it. Right. Thanks so much Koyli for inviting me firstly and it's a big honor to be a part of this panel and uh, what I wanted to share with you quickly was the two 
Uh, actually, I've been I've been part of uh, many projects, but uh, the one one project that I did, which was a physical show, and we had you know sort of uh, decided that we were not going to do it online because it was something which was sensorial. It was looking at the idea of spices. So you know, when I had thought about it, I I I, I had uh, envisioned like a little bit of a garden outside, which we, where we bring in the spices, put them there, have people interact with it, come inside. Then uh, two artists had worked with the idea of smell, so it was very important to have a physical manifestation of the show. So we actually waited, uh, you know, and we and the artists had more time to create the works. Uh, you know, I have made a small slideshow, so my request to Jyoti would be to sort of do the slide uh, thingy. How do we put it on? Jyoti, are you there? Hello? Yes. Yes, Georgina. I'll be yeah. uh, sharing the slideshow in a minute. Minute? Okay. Hmm. So Actually, talk... that. But yes, <laughs> ready with yeah, no, the thing is that uh, I wanted to show you the images. So when Smishi comes, we'll... In the meantime, uh, Koyli, you can ask me some questions about the difficulties we faced. Maybe I can share that. Just give me a little inspiration. We, we are ready, Georgina. Ready? Oh, good. Yes. Okay, so then start the slideshow, please. Is it clear or is it pixelated? It's okay, right? It's clear, yeah. It's clear. Okay, so this is uh, the impact of the pandemic on art making and creation. Next slide, please. This is a show that I had curated. So the artists uh, over here are, uh, where are you? There was Karl and Tao, Vasudra Tiwari, Lavanya Mani, Khanjan Dalal. Uh, this artist, so, where is it? Chetan Mevada, Kishore Chakravarti. Uh, then there was uh, this a young artist also who's part of the show, Vishwanath Kutum, whose work uh, we will see in the slides later. And then we had a last uh, sort of addition of Manjit Bawa which was a very uh, fortunate thing because I was talking to Ina Puri at uh, lunch that Bhavna Kakkar had thrown for all of us. And we were celebrating the possibility of meeting in 2021. And she told me, she said, oh, you're doing a show on spice. You must, you must include Manjit's work because he used to make this amazing Began Kabartha for her. So then we decided that he had, we would definitely include he had uh, made these uh, shoras, uh, which, uh, you know, they're like platters uh, with KG, uh, KG Subramanyam and Jogan Chaudhary in Shanti Nikhetan. So that was in her personal collection and she shared it with us. Next slide, please. So this is the setting up of the show that happened at the gallery. We, we managed to get people to actually come. Initially, we had to wait. So the staff was putting it up, but uh, then we managed to get somebody from outside who was a professional who's been putting up many shows. And he came and fatafat he put up Kishore's work. And uh, fatafat means quickly, really, really quickly he managed to do it. And that was really a big relief for us. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the process now. Uh, one of the artists, Arun Kumar uh, FG, had decided to work on star anise. So the star anise, something that he actually ground the star anise and put the paste in this uh, paper mache work that he had created. So the middle slide is the, uh, the first uh, paper mache uh, star anise. Then the final one is on the wall. And he also made uh, another, I don't know if you can see it because of these things are on it, all our pictures are on it, but it's a, it's a collection of 10 years of collection of leaves, uh, different leaves that uh, are from spice uh, gardens. 
and he is kind of graded out because there is a kind of a monoculture which is happening because of uh, you know certain commercial you know thing pressures that we have so only certain spices are getting grown and the others have actually got extinct so that is a very sad and shocking uh, reality that many of us are not even aware of we think ki those spices are growing and how they must be doing well but they are not actually they are not doing that well next slide please next slide please just one sec just give me a ah, second there's some technical problem yeah yeah, yeah i think so. just give me okay, a second okay okay no problem no problem yeah so i just uh, tell you uh, those who are not familiar with arun kumar's work he does a lot of work which is looking at the environment he is an activist also and he is part of a group in gurgaon where they are trying to uh, do bird watching in the morning they have a group that goes out and they look at the birds and they are trying to plant trees in gurgaon and they are trying to also he made a really astounding sculpture out of plastic it was huge it was like a room and you enter into it and you know you see uh, the kind of if effects that plastic has on you so uh, arun kumar is somebody who has been working on this uh, theme of uh, environment and uh, you know agriculture and he also comes from an agricultural background he has an agricultural family and he lives in karnataka and uh, so th these things are very very close to his heart and he feels extremely passionate about it i don't know what's happening with the slide show uh, can we go to the next slide or is there some problem ha ah, very good so this is kanjan dalal the next artist uh, so you can see how the work evolved from uh, the sketch on the left hand side uh, where he looked at the idea of a bag of stories so he said i'm going to do a work where i look at this portly of kani bag of stories uh, uh the stories are of the farmers so the the jira that basically the cumin that gets grown in gujarat most of it is exported at least 30% of the uh, you know uh, cumin that we use in india is from gujarat so uh now what has has happened is that the farmers are not able to predict the rains anymore because of the kind of global warming that we are seeing with the climate change so the idea is that they are facing problems and uh, it so happened it just so happened that this work also coordinated with the farmers protests that were happening in delhi so it became even more political because it was talking about how they are not getting they are only getting like 16% of that whole 30% that is going out and uh, you know they are not they not able to make a, a living so what happens is the inside these bags i think next slide hello jyoti apologies um, uh, georgina uh, ah. slide show is getting stuck up but we will oh, restore okay. it and we'll uh, we'll share it again right i'm so sorry about that so anyways um, the uh, the next slide shows the the image of the story that uh, the farmers were he took their photographs and made like a postcard so you have the farmer sitting in in his farm and at the back of that you have his story which is telling us about uh, how he is not able to yeah there it is so the image of the farmer the postcard made by kanjan here and then we have two artists kanjan uh, you know kanjan chandar and her son pallav chandar both of them are artists in delhi uh, who had come to the show and they taken out the the cards and they are reading it so uh, the work was very interactive it got people to come out and even though they are wearing their masks and they are scared a little bit but they all came and put their hand inside and they took away the cards so that was very fortunate now there's something else happening change collaboration something something i don't know okay uh next slide is it possible to show the next slide so we come to the next work which is carl and tau uh carl is also somebody who lives in ahmedabad and uh, he had uh, decided to revisit an older work of his 
where uh, he had been inspired by this idea of the flower pot you know and he made this flower pot out of uh, clay and one fell on because he's not a, he's not a potter one fell on top of the other and this it it kind of got elongated and then he was like oh this is a really interesting phallic form and he developed it into this kind of a garlic spice and garlic is an aphrodisiac which is something that we don't know about a lot of people don't you know in india there are certain uh, castes and certain uh, people who don't eat garlic for that reason because they they feel, they feel that if it, if it, they get all you know aroused when they eat the garlic so uh, and and we have you know that there's a lot of uh, mythology also around garlic because it's supposed to be something that keeps the vampires away which is very interesting uh so he decided to work with this garlic and he and uh, what i really liked about the fact that carl despite the pandemic went to his studio got his workman to uh, come and and he added a twig, the twig of the you can see the garlic twig coming out from the from some so sort of like a uh, you know it's like vishnu's vishnu's uh, birthing the the universe from his navel almost and it's it's very interesting that the that the male is giving birth in this particular instance i, I thought it was a very interesting interpretation that carl gave the work and so this is another story spice of story, uh, story of spice that we shared through this work next slide please this is uh, just the opening we had uh, people coming they would just uh, keep it at a small group you can see four people there that's monica in the middle monica and me monica owns the gallery and and she was very patient and dealt with all the various things that we had to you know take care of because the works were coming in especially kanjan's work was ceramic so we were all very scared that it shouldn't break and everything and those are the two girls who are working in the gallery both of them are young artists next slide please yeah so this is how the show looked we have vasundra tiwari's work on the far left she had worked with the idea of the rose petals and yoga so the idea that you know getting inner calm during the time of the pandemic because everybody uh, was getting really agitated mentally so yoga is one way that you can exercise your body and you can also get calm calm your mind and the interesting thing is that this natraj posture is something which is supposed to connect the the, the universe outside the the galaxy and the earth so you have the universe the, the legs are going into the universe outside but they're merging with these beautiful rose petals which give us a lot of uh, you know calm and and beauty in our life next and then over here we have uh, lavanya mani's work the two small uh, rounders i think maybe we have a better slide of her work later on uh, she works with the the kalamkari uh, style and she uses uh, spice a lot in her work because she talks about the post colonial and the you know sort of trade that has happened between the countries and and the whole idea of uh, the dutch and the english and uh, even the portuguese coming and trading with india and we were known as the soni ki chidiya which is the golden bird and uh, even vasudha tiwari has made us soni ki chidiya and then in the middle we have this beautiful work by uh, this artist called mega patpatia and she is a young artist who got a coach grant and she made this work and it looks at the whole idea of you know at the mankind in in the uh, anthro anthro uh, what is it called um, anthropocene the age of the anthropocene so the idea that you know uh, in the age of the anthropocene uh, mankind is kind of you know sort of on top of nature in the sense in not in not in a very pleasant way and we've kind of uh, ruined the planet so we are we are now you know bearing even this covid is part of that whole you know delicate balance of nature being disturbed so she's talking about that next slide please georgina ha yeah i'm just so, winding up quickly uh, uh, one interesting uh, thing at this point i'm sorry to interject the no, Uh, the entire uh, pandemic uh, situation during 2020 around the summers uh, it was we were uh, the farmers were uh, hit by locust in, uh, uh, 
in manifestation everywhere in yeah Maharashtra all over the Bihar. place even even in haryana they came yeah yes and uh, then in bengal we had the storm that uh, huge storm that destroyed uh, agriculture and yes. uh, then the entire focus went on to production and you know uh, how to sort of uh, manage the produce and people were still uh, needing food and all that so the whole artist instead of you know uh, sort of um, uh, distressing about their own uh, difficulties they have mirrored the situation in their work and this exhibition is brilliant it shows that uh, Uh, entire uh, effort that has gone into producing uh, spices and cultivating thank you thank you for that uh, so this is uh, a collection of the works you can see lavanya's work better also you can see uh, our friend uh, over here with the with the, with, with the goat the he is actually a, a sri lankan artist and in sri lanka are not sorry sorry andaman in the andaman and nicobar islands they have this festival where the goat is sacrificed for lord shiva and and ma kali and uh, the the goat is actually you know lulled by eating hemp which makes it slightly intoxicated so that then when it's uh, you know you do the halal which is uh, you cut the, the mm -hmm. gently cut the neck of the goat and then it 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 passes away so the skin uh, and the body doesn't tense up you know so that is uh, something that he's talking about and you can see how the and and if you if you look at the painting closely you'll see that the, that there's a human skeleton hidden inside the the very sort of leafy uh, hemp which uh, which you have there and then there's kishor chakravarti who talked about the uh, idea of uh, communism and he is he's like a you know looking at the idea of the failed communism in in bengal and uh, the idea of the pan peak you know where people spit out the pan and he put he put gold inside it so to say that that there is also a precious quality to it you know so next slide please quickly to talk about uh, another thing that happened uh, during the pandemic was the performance uh, festival organized by shatadru soban and the hexidoxy box collective of performance artists so um the the nice thing about performance art is that it can happen live like how we are doing this webinar you know so many webinars happen performance Georgina, happen. could we discuss the festival uh, the performance because i had a question to you uh, yeah sure sure end. sure so, sure yeah. we can discuss it later no problem yes yeah and we've also seen a lot of images so that has to sink in so okay i think Yeah, we could do this a little later. Sure, sure. Coming back to this. Yeah. Sharon, they're doing it. This is just a little slow, I think. I think it's yeah. technology. Yes. Bear with yes. us. Hi, Sharon. My uh, next question is to you. Please tell us about your experience of uh, continuing with your I wish to say project. and uh, in the middle of the pandemic uh, in the brooklyn uh, public library sure maybe before i do that i just wanted to respond a bit to georgina's um uh show i thought that was really wonderful to to think about the idea of spices and and the role of the senses in the pandemic and how i think our sense like our craving for that type of sensual experience is really heightened And, and so the show seems seems really timely, and it made me think back to. Um, sorry, this is going off, but I I, I feel it's like nice to respond to the to the discussions and or, you know to what's at, what's sure. at hand. And yes. um, I, you know I I um, I am I'm Jewish. I'm not super religious, but there's this tradition in Judaism that you know after the end of Shabbat, which is a day of rest, there's a ceremony called Havdalah. and with that ceremony you you smell spices so the idea is you smell sweet spices like cinnamon or something like that um to mark the end of of that day of that special day and and the beginning of going back to sort of regular time and 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 long ago i'd thought about making a a work that sort of referenced uh that idea and i've I never actually managed to make it but your presentation made me think back to that that idea and that it may be sort sort of timely to 
to go back to. I, I, because I do think the pandemic is is making artists think rethink their their work and and think about you know diff, maybe even very different ideas. So with my own work, I I have been doing this project called I Wish to Say uh, for almost two decades. Uh, very hard to believe, but I I go around with a manual typewriter and I set up in a public space um, and invite people to come up and, to me and uh, dictate a postcard to the U.S. president. I've done different iterations where there are different message, different um, frameworks for the for the show, but this the I wish to say show was the first one. And I've typed about 4,500 cards in, in about 150 performances around the US over this time. And, and I had, I, I usually get very busy in election years. Of course, 2020 was an election year for the, in the US. And I had a number of events planned <clears throat> prior to the pandemic for fall 2020. And of course, when the pandemic struck, <clears throat> we were not really clear, how, you know, what would happen, whether we would be able to do this work because it involves this really close face-to-face -face, uh, interaction. And so through a series of discussions with two of the main presenters, one was the University of Michigan and one was the Brooklyn Public Library, I came up with several different ways of ways of, of managing things. So the, the first one was that we, we I created a, a way of doing this over Zoom, which was, which was, Quite fascinating, actually. I worked with a team of students in Michigan uh, from my university at Wayne State and then University of Michigan, and they each received a manual typewriter. So I had about 12 students. And then during a series of events um, over Zoom, people could join the Zoom call and then be put into a breakout room to privately speak with the typist um, about their wishes for the next um, next president. And those those messages were typed up and the originals get sent out to the White House and I keep a carbon copy for my archive. Um, what, what was remarkable was, was, the, was the response in terms of like, all, the student typists got together uh, once or twice a week as a group for about five weeks. And, and that proved to be very, very important, I think, for their, um, for their mental health in some way. It really helped build this little community of people when we were so separated and then for the people who participated, it, it also seemed to be um, like a lifeline almost um, out to the world. So it was quite powerful. And then in Brooklyn, we did something similar. Well, the, there were both the Zoom events, but I also did present one very large scale in-person event. I was able to do that. It was a, we, we typed on a very beautiful fall day and everybody wore masks and we, we set things up so that there was a certain distance between the typist and the participant. And then we, ha we had a typing event um, in front of the Brooklyn Public Library in New York that went on for an entire afternoon and, and about 100 people came up to uh, the typists and, and were, shared their messages for the next president. Cheryl, I also wanted to share a little bit of the beginning of our wish to say and the journey. The, so the you mean how the project started? Yes. So um, it's always hard to synthesize it quickly, but I, I had um, done a different project that actually goes very relevant since this is the Goethe Zentrum. I'd been working in Berlin and had created this large scale installation called Writer's Block that was shown on Babelplatz, which is the site of the Nazi book burning in Berlin. And those sculptures were massive sculptures made out of construction steel and filled with hundreds of typewriters. And it was shown there in Berlin and then went to New York and several other cities. Um, so there was an organization in San Francisco that wanted to show that work and they weren't sure how to do it. So they invited me out to San Francisco to talk to them about it. And the guy just said sort of offhand, well, if you have another thing that you want to do while you're out here, just, you know, that's easier to do, let me know. And I had been thinking about this idea of uh, the person on the street interview, which ties into my own background as a journalist. Um, also, my grandmother um, was a secretary in the political science department at the University of Maryland, and and she always went to work very, very dressed up with wigs and jewelry, and you know, very, very the typical sort of woman of the of the sixties. Um, and she always let me play dress up with her things when I went to visit, and so there was that dress up connection and. 
And there's also the the phenomenon which I know exists in India. I saw it when I was there some years ago, where the public typist, right, the typist that is sitting in the street taking dictation of people's legal documents or letters. And um, there was actually a movie called Central Station that takes place in Brazil, where there's a woman uh, typist set up set up in the train station taking dictation of people's letters. So all those things came together to inspire that work, as well as my own feeling that that the voices of very regular people, sort of ordinary people, were not being heard in in the media. And so this was a way to set up and, and invite anybody to come and speak their mind. So those are the various influences and in what led to the start of the project that has has just keeps going. And it, people keep telling me amazing stories. And so I, I keep typing. Thank you so much. We have more questions about uh, your Brooklyn uh, uh, work, and uh, but we'll come back to you in the third round. Uh, so, Bashri, my question to you is, uh, when there is no help coming uh, at this time, especially uh, in many parts of the uh, world, there are uh, social securities are not available especially to creative professionals. How will they sustain their work? I mean, where I stay in Denmark, it's quite privileged. But we have also had just other day when we were talking, I said that everybody survived. Actually, it's not true because I was a volunteer in, uh, in, in a, it's not an NGO really. Uh, it's called Trampoline House who works with the refugees. Uh, especially, uh, I, I was involved in the Refugee Women's Club. And they have a, uh, another section which is called Camp Center for Art and Migration uh, Politics, which has actually been closed because there was no fund coming towards uh, refugees who make art, you know. Uh, but the good thing is that they will participate. They, the, the 10 years of work they have done, uh, it will be showcased in Documenta. Uh, which is rescheduled to next year, I guess. But it's very sad that camp is closed. And I was very much uh, associated with camp. It's very close to my house. Uh, so that's a lot, one thing. I mean, when this kind of thing happens, normally in, in Denmark or Scandinavian countries, the social security is so good. It's very difficult to be poor, you know. It's really difficult. But... When it's coming to refugees, when it's coming to people without papers, nobody cares about them. It's the same everywhere. And with this pandemic, we can see that all these things like the borders and biopolitics uh, came into forefront. So the refugee problem is just gone into the backside, you know. And then refugees making art is something even more so all the funds which was coming towards the uh, trampoline house or camp is just vanished. So who survive and who doesn't survive is a big question, even if it, in a country like Denmark. So, but what happens is that I think a lot of people started the, because we all inherently created people, right? And I, I believe in this Joseph Boy's uh, thing that every, everybody is artist and everything is art. So there's a democracy in art. Uh, and we noticed that because people were so scared uh, that a lot of people embraced art as a therapy. And art entered home. And also because right now I'm researching in the visual culture department and my research subject is which, and I'm also working a lot with herbs and spices, how we take care of, especially when there was no vaccine. So I was calling my mother, what should I do? I am having this asthma, maybe it's COVID and what, but we can get to test very fast. But what my mother said is, Take turmeric and uh, four uh, peppercorn every morning and uh, lemon and uh, warm water. That's what I'm still doing, still doing because I didn't take vaccine. And then she also told about uh, making uh, some spices together and boiling it like all uh, cardamom, cinnamon, uh, holy basil. So I just keep uh, boiling them and keep it 
with me and also i i try to uh, sniff them that whether i get the smell because uh, and it immediately keeps me warm and nice i don't know whether it's uh, placebo or not but i'm working on it and i'm asking other people that how do you take care of your salts like from different culture like latin america or africa or here in denmark also so different people knows their indigenous knowledge especially women uh, and then they trying to heal themselves with that and that's one part of my research project <laughs> and um, yeah so i i have some slides i can show you later on if i you... wanted to i think it's relevant to see the uh, slide of uh, yourself voice you had some uh, or the democrat democracy of art that uh, I think it was relevant at this point. Yeah, if Jyoti is showing the slides. If it is possible. Okay. So this is basically how art became everywhere. This is Banksy, of course, one of my favorite artists. The next slide, please, Jyoti. Yeah. I think it's also important how we are thinking about home at this point because we have to stay at home right so revisiting the old uh, ancient uh, philosophies the greek or the indian so ecology basically came from oikos and economy also came from oikos and in that point i just wanted to say that vasudeva kutumbakam which is which means the whole world is a family is very very important at that this point because we can't really touch each other but we still have to stay in this war together so how we make sense of a community and home and when there's border and biopolitics is very very important next slide please jyoti so then i i actually have some art and ecology uh, uh, exhibition which i was been told by my tutor of conceptual ecology but i can come back to it later on probably but it's also related how indigenous cultures are taking care of the ecology and how we have to think about that we all are interconnected the floras faunas virus whatever you know uh, so but i can come back to it later if we just go a little further in the slides yeah these are all very important uh, exhibitions next and this is actually quite important maybe azumi can uh, talk a little about it because he is a, a japanese artist and this exhibition just finished i missed it but it's very much uh, related to my work next slide please but i would ask azumi to put on a little so what i thought is because art entered home and uh, you if you just the next last slide if you notice there was some uh, sprout uh, was coming up in one of the slides and uh, but i didn't see that exhibition photo before but i thought everything is really have art i mean how we look at it and life i i write it like life thrives in the most mundane place so is art i think next slide please So basically, everything entered the domestic life, the office, museum, and everything. Next slide, please. So this is a, a photographer from New York, David Brandon, and you know how to use the boredom. And he he just found inspiration in every everyday thing, like toilet paper, uh, oranges, or you know, piece of cake. Everything just became an art object. Next slide, please. so i also was doing a lot of uh, fermentation and uh, pickles and you saw everyday things like you know the garlic and uh, uh, yeah, now i the danish name is coming uh, ginger everything every everyday thing came became a, a like a art object the first photo uh, which is in the corner is is by david brandon but the rest is mine and i was taking a very close up of my pickle uh, uh, garlic pickle which looks like a painting to me anyway next uh, slide please very interesting <laughs> thank you and it's and this... amazing how spices are coming up 
because yeah, that was initially yeah, yeah. the cure when there was no yeah. medication. Yeah, and this fermentation is very. I I, I actually come to it um, come to know about it much later. There's a curator who is working with fermentation and feminism, which is called fermenting feminism, and the book launch will be the one which happened in Copenhagen. The book launch will be, I think, next week. But these are my photos of during the pandemic, and nobody eats this fermented vegetables or pickle in my home. But I was doing it like a like a therapy, you know. Uh, so I, I thought, okay, what if tomorrow there is no food? Because that's what happened in India. One day to another, when I was in India, there was a lockdown, and we didn't know what to buy because my mother is buying vegetables every day, fresh vegetables. And then I had this panic in me that if there's nothing, of course in Denmark it's not like that. Everything is open, and we have access to everything. But just this panic made me fermented a uh, lot of things. Beetroot I never eat, uh, cucumber sometimes, but I was just doing it because it was coming like a therapy to me. And then I later on I come to this fer fermenting feminism and also gut feminism. And now I'm reading glitch feminism. Anyway, next slide, please. And also again, this the board became the beautiful. Next slide. And of course, Banksy also made this rat inside the bathroom and the and the underground. Next. Yeah, I think now. What he did is a wonderful job. He invited a lot of artists and non-artists, Grace and Perry, to showcase their work. So art became for everyone. Next slide. We can come back to it later on to, to get into, but I just want to show a visual very fast. Next slide, please. Yeah, and of course, I think art can bring us a lot of hope to stay with despair. So this rainbow is coming not only in the Damien Hirst uh, work, but it's coming in the next slide, you will see. And he was actually doing two work. One is to raise money and the other is to, uh, you can buy, uh, you can just download the posters and stuff like that. Next work, next slide please. Yeah. And he was doing 10 uh, rainbow postcard where he meant to say hope is everywhere, rainbow, we can just carry this uh, everywhere. Next, please. And this the same rainbow appeared in Denmark also, which means uh, salmon, where for sai means together but separately. Like we have to uh, face this pandemic, but how we begin together when this words like social bubble, you can't be more than five people and things like that, but you can still help each other. Like I know when I came back uh, in Denmark, we had to stay in a quarantine. So my husband was staying in a boat and we were staying uh, in our apartment, but suddenly the bathroom was uh, blocked and I didn't know what to do because I can't go to supermarket. I was in quarantine. So I wrote in the Facebook, uh, that in, if anybody can help me. So somebody just came with some uh, this chemical and kept uh, uh, right uh, outside my door. So things like this, you know, help just coming from, I, I don't even know. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll just give you a bottle of wine or chocolate. So don't bother. If, you, if your bathroom is saved, I'm happy. So next. Uh, yeah, I think we can come back to this maybe later. Yes, that would be good. Yeah, thank you. Azumi, I was very curious to know about the your uh, therapeutic work that you yes. do. Yes. And uh, earlier I had the, I could see that video, five minutes of Koroko. It mm -hmm. would be great to, uh, if you share it with us here. Okay, so just one moment. So it's uh, it's a series of uh, video, uh, and then it's called uh, uh, Five Minutes on Japanese Wisdom. And this is the episode that uh, uh, we made, uh, actually. And let's see. How... So. 
So, okay, just one moment. Uh, I'm going to share it now. So actually, this is, uh, I'm going to explain about the uh, um, Japanese word means, uh, it means kokoro is our heart, but in Japanese, it's not like in English or uh, other European language. It's not about the organ of our heart, but it's actually the, the kokoro is the, the, uh, the heart that contains our feelings, etc. So I'm going to show you now uh, this video. Precious and fragile. Just one second, sorry. Kokoro is very precious and fragile. So just to explain, uh, this is the, it's like the little container. This is the means Kokoro. Uh, Kokoro is, uh, yeah, it's, it's written here. Kokoro. Yes, it's a heart, our heart, invisible uh, organ <laughs> that contains our emotions and our feelings. So Kokoro is not our uh, organ heart. Do, do you understand? Yes. Okay, so, um, so then I'm going to co explain about uh, what it is and how we can actually um, uh, uh, keep it clean and keep our beautiful, uh, 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 keep our heart uh, beautiful uh, with some metaphors. So I hope you enjoy. Well, through our life, we go through uh, many painful events and heartbreaking events, trauma, and stressful events as well. And sometimes we wrap our kokoro, we wrap up our kokoro with many things, or we put our walls around our kokoro. But we need to take this kokoro out of our boxes, our walls, and we need to feel it, what's in the kokoro. So like, this is the metaphor, it's in a box. You see what comes out, our kokoro. Put the box, beautifully, because it's a precious object. Paper, wrap, another wrap it, because it's precious. But, so this is a tea bowl, handmade and hand painted. So this bowl is really like cocoa. So this tea bowl will hold beautiful matcha tea. Um, but it can also hold any liquid um, that's maybe dirty. So our cocoa also contains and stores not only our beautiful love, compassionate feelings, but also painful emotions, painful feelings inside. But we need to see, we need to listen what's in your kokoro, like <clears throat> as I'm holding like this cup. And when we accept what's in it, the painful feelings, then uh, this energy can be transmuted. So if we have dirty water in it, then we take it out. So in our kokoro, in our invisible uh, table, when we have painful feelings, painful emotions, we can transmute into our love and our compassion when we see it. But first acknowledging it takes time. Even our heart is broken, even, our, even this gets broken. There's a method called kintsugi. Uh, put the broken parts together and decorate with gold. So we can, trans we can transform uh, the broken object, broken heart. So, so just one moment. I'm gonna, yes. So uh, that was um, uh, yeah. 
that was I used a metaphor, but uh, uh, in a therapeutic way, I use, uh, well, I'm also the artist, but also, uh, sorry, um, can I say, uh, I use uh, calligraphy, Japanese calligraphy art as to teach uh, the spirituality as an educator. So, and also a coach. Um, so I use, uh, as you see in the first uh, part, uh, you saw the kokoro, it was uh, with the, the uh, Japanese calligraphy. So, for example, uh, Koeli, if you come to me, and then we will practice uh, the calligraphy. But it's not to, about writing, but then you actually go through with the movement of the brush. You can actually let uh, whatever in our heart to come out. So it's not just writing with the hands, but uh, we use the entire body. So I do the you know, body awareness meditation and then through that our uh, feelings, emotion comes through our hands and our, to our brush to, to on the paper. So that's uh, the therapeutic way that uh, I use and I work. And especially during this pandemic, um, when I was able to bring, uh, invite clients one-to-one, -one, uh, I do, but then also uh, through the online sessions that I have been helping uh, from the business executives, uh, artists, and students. So uh, that's uh, uh, one with the, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, as a business, art, culture, and spirituality, and spiritual side. So, uh, so then, uh, uh, you've been able to help a lot many people. Who uh, did they sort of reach out to you for help? Were there many? Yes, and they also it's actually expanding. And they, at the moment, well, since February, I have also been um, giving online talk uh, lecture uh, through London-based organization once a month, and the. So then every month we have the topics and the, uh, it's not just about the uh, lecture, but how we can bring uh, using Japanese wisdom, how we can navigate our life uh, with Japanese wisdom, Japanese art, Japanese spirituality. Uh, so then in online experience, not just online talk, but it's more like a dialogue and also the experience I bring and I guide people. This is interesting. I was just wondering that uh, if you're able to collaborate across the globe, now mm -hmm. that uh, everything is working online, mm -hmm. because recently I came across uh, a project, a collaborative project between two museums, and uh, that is Asia Society and New York Historical Society. They have brought together uh, an exhibition, and which is called Dreaming Together. And it has happened as a conscious effort. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you aware of that exhibition? Uh, uh, one in New York? Yes. Uh, I, well, I'm not aware of this, but uh, yeah. Uh, for example, uh, I help, uh, like for example, I work with Van Gogh Museum here in the Netherlands. And the, um, especially in this time, uh, art is something that also, I think all of us now, um, we use art as to bring the light and hope to, uh, to the world. And the, so especially this time, art really brighten up people's uh, hearts, etc., uh, and bring the light in this difficult time. So for example, um, with the Van Gogh Museum that uh, I, um, you know, I support and we have actually uh, yeah, find a, a project to uh, strengthen our friendship with uh, our corporate uh, sponsors. So then, you know, how we can actually remotely uh, strengthen our relationships, because especially for the museum, uh, I think all over the world, it has been the same and they need to show physically and then to show it online is very limited. And then this uh, connection uh, is, and the physical experience is limited. So that has become our challenge and our, uh, you know, um, uh, our challenge to overcome. So 
we had more questions about the Van Gogh project. Yes. But uh, also some, you said something which sparked a thought and I wish to go to Georgina uh, with the idea of the physicality. See, there are a lot of artists who are not just needing a gallery to showcase their work. They are performers, visual artists who it does installation work. So you know, G Georgina, have you seen any work happening during this time? Were they be able to reach out to an audience? Yes, I had mentioned earlier, but thank you for, for getting me back on. Uh, I'd mentioned earlier about Chitadru's project, where yeah. he had a series of performance, uh, you know, workshops uh, with people from across the globe coming and, uh, you know, participating in that project. And uh, he, the first the first one that I took part in means I took part in the sense that I was uh, helping with a little bit of uh, which is a curatorial intervention. But all the main thing that he was presenting was uh, looking at the idea of light. So I want to show those slides. Quickly, I'll show those slides. Yes. Uh, can, can we go to, to the slideshow? Jyoti, is it possible? And uh, the, first, the first one that I took part in means I took part in the sense that I was uh, helping with a little bit of uh, which is a curatorial intervention. But all the main thing that he was presenting was uh, looking at the idea of light. So I want to show those slides. Quickly, I'll show those slides. Yes. Uh, can, can we go to, to the slideshow? Jyoti, is it possible? And uh, he, the, first, the first one that I, I took part in means I took part in the sense that I was uh, helping with a little bit of uh, stop the audio, curatorial please? intervention. Hello. But all the main thing that he was presenting was uh, looking at the idea of light. So I want to show those slides quickly. I'll show those slides. Yes. Uh, can, can we go to, to the slideshow? Jyoti, is it possible? And uh, if the first the first one that I took part in means I took part in the center. Can you, can you, can you stop uh, the helping with the little bit? Uh, Let me stop the audio, please. Intervention. Hello. When all the hello, hello, thing hello. that he was presenting was uh, looking at the yeah, idea of light. So yeah, I want yeah. to show those slides. Quickly, I'll show those slides. Yes. Uh, yes can can we go to, to the slideshow? Jyoti, is it possible? And uh, if the first the first one that I took yeah, part in means I took part in the center. Sorry about that. It uh, looks like there was some technical problem there. Uh, the recording kept playing. Yes. The recording Sorry about that. Us. Yeah, but I'll just uh, acquaint you with Chatadru Sovan's work in the meantime. He's an artist who lives in Delhi, but he's uh, essentially somebody who's been performing uh, with, with uh, you know, various topics, gender and sexuality being one of them. And, uh, you know, one of the things that he looks at is the whole idea that uh, your gender and your sexuality is something which remains hidden. It's not, uh, you know, something that is out there. And uh, the idea that Facebook and social media gives us a kind of a platform where we can interact. So this is something that he looked at even pre-pandemic. Even before the pandemic came and he was looking at the idea of Facebook being this place where you can, you know, take on any avatar that you want. And uh, now with the pandemic happening and the, and the whole, you know, idea of not being able to go out of the house, we were all looking for ways to reinvent ourselves. Like, uh, you know, Subhashri uh, shared how she was making the pickles and how she was afraid that the food was going to go out. And then how that other artist, uh, what is his name? Where is his name? Uh, can't, can't get the name right now. But uh, anyway, the artist, uh, Damien Hurst, made the, made the rainbow heart. So similarly, Shatadru was looking at the idea of light being this, uh, you know, vehicle and sort of symbol of, of a sort of energy, a, a sexual energy or a gender uh, identity that remains hidden but it's coming out slowly through these performances. So this is one of the slides where he's uh, doing the performance. Next slide, please. And here's another one. Can we go to the next slide now? Hello. 
the slide shows a bit of uh, there is a little bit of lag it is coming up okay great uh they were daughters also yeah so you can see here there are two performances using light one is the daylight which is falling on him and uh, he has got a clock on top of him uh, so that you know you're looking at the are you able idea. to see the presentation uh, georgina i can see it yeah can you see it can, I, can everybody else quickly can i yes. can every can you see yes. it yes yeah so the clock is looking at the idea of the time the passing of time which has become very difficult with the the you know being locked in during the pandemic a time seems to uh, otherwise get away but it, here it seems almost frozen and uh, the idea of the you know eating food and then here he is doing a little bit of beauty treatment with the hair dryer and uh, you know kind of taking uh, the mask off and sort of uh, you know being with the self that is the whole uh, idea then uh, there were other artists also can we go to the next slide i'm just sharing the two other performers yeah so there were besides uh, that there was umesh naik and sanskar varma so uh, they were also talking about the idea of light in umesh's work you can see that there is a kind of a desire to escape the way i read it was that there's a desire to escape through the ladder but you can't really go anywhere because it's your your contained within your house and this box in which you're getting trapped kind of uh, you know where uh, he's putting his leg through but uh, unfortunately you can't get out so the idea of being trapped is coming through very strongly in his work whereas the other artist is sort of celebrating a little bit being at home and using the greenery around him to enrich his life and he's growing this plant and using this uh, sort of yoga again the reference to the yoga postures uh, you know so th th there were lots of slides which i which i have with me of shatadru's performance but i decided to you know keep it short because i didn't know how much time i had so the uh, the basic crux that i wanted to present was that during this whole time we saw so many performances which talked about issues of environment issues of gender sexuality issues of even migration so this this idea of performance is something which can be very powerful and it 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 really worked well with in the during the pandemic because you could just put your camera there and have a trapped audience in front of you looking at your you know live performance which is really uh, really nice and i do congratulate chatadru and his team at at the oxy doxy box collective for presenting us with that the next the last slide that i wanted to end Koyli, I don't know if you want to touch on that topic right now about the museums. Should yes, we yes, come to that later? Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, because I've got questions about uh, this one. You want to ask to... about the? Ha, you yeah. want to ask about Shatadru first? Yes, yes. Okay. Ask. Yeah. Once you finish your last slide, then. Ha, my yeah. last slide is uh, very simple, saying that. uh you know there might be yet another lockdown that that puts a dampener on all the physical shows that we had because we had uh in delhi we had a, a festival called deco which is the delhi art contemporary um, art collective and um, they had a they had a lovely physical opening at bikani house there are lots of slides which i cannot show of that because that will take up another hour <laughs> but i was also part of the bihar museum uh, launched there in invited me to moderate one of the panels where they had irana speaking and they had parish maiti seema kohli in which they were all these artists and and arpana kaur they all these artists and and subodh gupta also they had presented works uh to the museum and some of them had been commissioned and the thing was that kalka pandey sort of did a whole series of talks where she said that you need to have a hybrid so you have a little bit of physical and you have a lot of online and that is the way we are going to deal with the pandemic 
my question was going to be this to you yes so is is technology going to be uh, the center stage in showcasing art now Or is there it's, any it's, you know, it's it's definitely going to play an important role because we are seeing that the pandemic has rolled out in India in a way that we were not expecting. Yeah, I thought that you know we we all thought I think that yes. we had come to a place where we were safe because the, the 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 vaccine was being exported, and now we've come to a point where there's not enough vaccine for the locals. There, there aren't enough oxygen tanks. People are dying because they don't have enough oxygen. So it is a terrible. Suddenly, a turn has happened, and it just shows you that you can't predict the pandemic. You can't predict. You can't say that oh, we are safe now. Let's take off our masks. Let's go jump in the coom. You know, I mean, I have a lot of critique of that. Unfortunately, coom is something which I have a lot of respect for. and i did a documentary with shalini kantaya where i was helping her you know uh, decode she had done a very early documentary on kum she is somebody who is who is a young filmmaker who lives in the us and she came on a full ride scholarship and i saw that the kind of work that she had done on kum mela but you know i was just wondering about the fact that the government decided to go ahead with it despite the pandemic it's a question that i put out there i mean uh, scared to put it but i put it that <laughs> definitely i mean safety uh, should be in the forefront of uh, all activities any kind of progress that you make and you wish to be uh, back in normal days and not uh, follow the norms i mean is extremely dangerous for the society and everybody i think without the vaccine we more sensitive definitely vaccine. um sherry i was just thinking that uh, um sometimes i feel like uh, requesting you uh considering that you know we do not uh, have support like other places have mm, projects are getting cancelled exhibitions are getting cancelled there is no work and then there is no support for artists and they even they cannot couldn't reach their studios to do work and they they had to sort of come up with a movement which says that art is work so how desperate it has got uh, do you think uh, you could do a, i wish to say for us in india oh that would sure that would be amazing i could do that i mean i could do it for anybody here on the call it's 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 it i think that there's something nice about reaching out um internationally in these times and also just wanted to respond a bit to Azumi's uh, presentation as well that was so beautiful and i one of the things i love about these types of talks is just that i always learn something and so the idea of two different words for heart and one that holds your emotions but one and one that is the you know the physical heart that doesn't exist in english and so it's um it's it's um it, it's a lovely word Uh, I think a little bit also just sort of along those lines, I'm in a babble, but because it's also, uh, you know, the Goethe Center, I also think about that with the word for history in German, the, the word Geschichte, which means history, but also means story. And I love the way that the, that there's these multiple meanings in, in that word. I think I've thought about that particular word a, a lot, and it's maybe very relevant for, for these times as well. well I, I think that we are living history as cliche as that sound it's we are living this really particular moment in history and i and i do think that my work documents the the stories that happen the in this very particular way and i've come to see it as a as a really feminist way because we're documenting individual people's stories as opposed to this giant collective which is usually what happens in in history books so that's a winding answer <laughs> Both is it possible to see a glimpse from uh, Sharon's uh, video? Not the entire. Sharon, could you share just a little glimpse of your uh, video of your "I wish to say"? Is it possible? Uh, yes, I think you were going to share it from there. I think it will work better. Yes, Jyoti, is it possible? I think the sound is not working. Somehow Sorry the sound is that. not on. 
Well, you get the, the, the idea, so I go... Not audible. We'll have to do with the visual, I guess. I'm sorry about so the, that. That's okay. So there's the, the type, the typist, that's, that's me setting up in Florida, and then people come up. Um, sorry, just a, a question. Uh, was the audio not working? Uh, would yes. you like me to play it again? Yes, that would be nice. Okay, I'll do that. Cheryl, any, uh, I mean, could you share with us some a moment uh, of your current recent work when you were doing the postcards, something that you carry with you? Oh, that's okay. Let's come back. You want to send a letter to the next president? Yes. How would you like to start? Uh, I guess as most people would start. Dear Mr. President. On behalf of myself, my family, and my community, I have a few requests. Free universal health care for each and every last person who is born in America. If you are a real Republican, you well, I am. protect the rights of American citizens first. If only you knew how it feels to be on the outside, looking in. This evening, our person of the week, and it has been quite a week. All these Republicans from around the country on a mission to re-elect their president, all the other people here from so many places to express their displeasure with Mr. Bush. Perhaps it was so many people talking past each other that made this young woman stand out. She thinks that communication is an art form. We met Cheryl Ory in the public square with her typewriter. Do you want to have a seat? There's something about the typewriter that really draws people in and also is a symbolic reminder of a different era when people took the time to write letters and people slowed down and listened to each other. I never cease to be amazed at the way people open up with me and tell me the most incredibly personal stories. When there's a typist sitting there listening to every word that the person in front of them speaks, it really gives that person the feeling that they've been listened to, that they've been heard. And I think therein lies the possibility for people making change. So I wish to say it has many influences. My grandmother was a secretary in the political science department at the University of Maryland. She always went to work dressed to the nines and let me play in her closet, put on her wigs and costume jewelry every time I visited. The other is my background as a journalist. So I worked for a number of years in newspapers. I found that constantly there were not very many women or people of color on the front page, and I was always bringing this up. When I started, I wish to say my idea was I want to give everyone a chance to speak their minds. Dear Mr. Trump, it's okay for you to be the president, but you cannot like make fun of people. I would like know the everyday person. I didn't think I like my letter would get to the president. Like honestly, like I swear, it's like, and I hope he get my letter. It's a very unique way of documenting history, and possibly a more feminine and feminist way of documenting history because I'm telling individual people's stories that are sometimes very, very personal. And when you read history books, that's usually lacking. You, you don't get that. The day after the election, all I could do was sob and sob and sob and sob and then apologize to my daughters, age 31 and 33. I accept responsibility for this. It is my generation that created this, and we have to reclaim it. I've typed 4,106 postcards to four different presidents these days when we mostly communicate over social media where you never meet the other person on the other end. There's something very human about the use of a typewriter. 
when technology has played such a destructive role in our society. We need a new form of communication, and we need to find a way of communicating that goes beyond the egocentrism that's implicit with Twitter. As the daughter of immigrants, I still believe in the promise of a democracy, and it's up to you to restore it, honor and respect the voices of all people. It's quite amazing to to witness how people respond when they're listened to. And what many of them have told me is they're just not used to it. They're not used to being listened to. And I think we really have to change that. The future of our country depends on it. That's the critical thing to me, that people become actively engaged in their communities in making positive change for the places that we live. Sharing, for sharing this amazing work of yours with us. Thanks for having me. Also, I keep wondering uh, that what made, what was the driving force for you to sort of, uh, amidst the pandemic, to uh, continue the work? Well, then, I've come to see the work as a way of documenting history and documenting it from a very individual point of view. And so we're, we're living through this incredible historical moment. So it, it felt very critical to, to do it. And then also I've been working with, with young people, with students, and I, I think young people are experiencing the pandemic in a particularly challenging way. It's very difficult for their mental health. So this was also a way to connect um, with some of our younger students, with their students in my, in my university and my community. Um, it's also it, it, one of my former students is a is an art teacher in a middle school here in, in in the U.S. and he is now doing the project in his school and he was sharing with me just the other day how incredibly moving and emotional the the messages were from his students and how it was different from even a couple of years ago when he had done it in his classroom that he he felt also like the students have young people have so much to say right now and they're experiencing so many challenges so it's a it's almost like a, a cathartic, somewhat therapeutic experience to, to do this. And I, I just have felt it's important to continue. Thank you so much for reaching out. You're welcome. So was she the Grayson's Art Club? Were they also trying to connect people? You said that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, meaning... I think mainly it's in UK, uh, so they are just uh, uh, artists, non-artists, they are just uh, every week they're showcasing, I think they have a TV uh, channel, so they are showcasing it uh, online. And so yeah, I think people have now to express themselves to art. And even, you know, it's, there's a story, I must say that uh, because everybody has to wear masks and there's a lot of problem, uh, refugee problem in, in, in Europe and US also, but I know the European part. So there's a girl who was hiding herself uh, in the mask. So there's a, this story comes up, uh, but nobody knows who is really hiding, you know? So this, this kind of thing, the, and also in Denmark, actually, wearing mask was forbidden last year. And uh, if you wear kind of mask, then you can get fined. But police were very reluctant about it because, I mean, this is a petty thing, right? Who will wear a burqa and who will wear a mask in the carnival? It's, and now everybody has to wear mask. So this rule is just gone. Mm -hmm. But I, I just wanted to say to Cheryl that uh, your work, I don't know why it reminded me of this, uh, I want to die for a president, uh, that Zoe Leonard's work. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say this, that because when we, I was having a module in performative, performativity in arts and uh, 
writing the first class and we were doing it online so people were all over the world but we were uh, say uh, saying this the whole thing uh, online uh, at the same time but it was quite a cacophony but i i feel very powerful by when we were reciting the poem um, yeah and it's it's a very That's powerful work here. and it's very relevant it was before the election and we were people of all colors all over the world so it felt really powerful and the moment i saw your video i just i just loved your work i must say <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I would love to meet someday. I, actually, all of you and me, we should have some big parties someday. <laughs> Everybody's doing such interesting work. Sorry, did I miss your uh, question, Koyali? Yes, yes, I was so uh, overwhelmed by the richness uh, you all are bringing. That uh, I'm so I'm glad here. there's some connection happening, and that's how it was uh, meant to be. I was curious about the Grayson's Art Club, and uh, there was this uh, the second, the last slide which we missed. Ah, okay. I've not noted it down here. It's not so important, but uh, we can just show because there's hope in it. So, but uh, there was one work I would say uh, which is probably related uh, is. Uh, okay, this is something which the state and no, the one before. Can you go back uh, seventeen? Yeah, this is uh, in response to the corona. Uh, how the artists are um, responding to the corona. So there's a laptop in the corner, and there's a video, and all this all this artwork is outside the museum because the museum is closed. And the good part of uh, the uh, exhibition is that it's called B roll, means uh, touched. But how we touch by the COVID, so everybody can send a hand and uh, the story along with it. And for every hand, uh, Coop will give uh, five krona to the Red Cross. And the Red Cross, I think they, they got like millions of uh, krona from these stories. Uh, and it goes to the people who are homeless and refugees, uh, to the people who are like less unfortunate. So I think that that the social part of the art is very very important here. We go to the next one. Yeah, I think uh, because you were you asked me to to talk about sustainability and art. Yes. And everybody knows about Extinction Rebellion. But of course, the main part of their work is to do this uh, civil disobedience, uh, but peacefully. But now they can't get, gather outside and they respect that rule. But how could, could they still work in this uh, time of pandemic? So they, they did a lot of uh, uh, campaigns, which is like alone, alone together is a hashtag alone together. And you can look at it. No, it's number 18. It, not this one, the next, sorry. Anyway, I can talk about it, but it, it's hashtag alone, to, alone together. That's what they are saying. And they are also talking about how can you still have a community because there's a lot of, in UK, I, I can hear from the friends uh, that there is a lot of people who are homeless, doesn't have access to food. There's, there's a lot of food banks come up. Uh, to distribute food and clothes also at the same time. And this is the uh, work of Mark, no, last one, yeah, Mark Tichner, which came all over London. And it's, it, it's a simple message of hope that please believe these days will pass. And it's all over London, he put it. Yeah. And that, that was the last slide with a little hope. And like the other day, I was saying that I believe that we are in a limbo and something bigger is coming and uh, we can make this world better again and with hope and with love. And that's it. And with art, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Subhashree.
Thank you. We'll stay with that message of Mark Tickner. Georgina, yeah. do we see a ray of hope in difficult times? Is sales happening really? You've been conducting so many exhibitions and there are so many online platforms. Are artists able to sell their work? So I just did a couple of stories for uh, the Hindu as well as for MASH. These are two uh, publications that I write for regularly. And uh, one is, you know, that, that people have not been spending money on travel. They've not been spending money on buying things. And art is something which has been going uh, online a lot. So they actually invested in art. Uh, so we, the, that money has gone towards that. And we've seen Guy Tonde, for example, you know, getting, um, he's, he's an abstract artist who's, uh, you know, been acknowledged by uh, the various international, large international galleries and abroad. And now finally he's getting his due. Uh, but his work recently sold, uh, you know, for a new, he, he made a new figure of crores of rupees, 30, uh, 32 crore, I think it went. Uh, and um, then there's also another segment where uh, younger artists are getting, you know, uh, sales happening online as well as physical, and uh, people are buying prints. So uh, there are new, young and new collectors who are coming into the market because now they have, uh, they are, they're all online. And the galleries are kind of appealing to them through uh, online exhibitions. And recently, we even saw this whole, uh, this, um, what is it called? The one with the Leonardo da, da Vinci, uh, what is it called? Now, suddenly, the name has, has gone out of my head. But uh, it was, it was, it was, um, or it was an online thing where you bought the rights for, uh, for the, for the artwork. You didn't, you didn't actually buy the artwork and this whole cryptocurrency. So there are all these kind of things happening, you know, uh, NEFT, it was an NEFT, the non-fungible uh, print. So the idea was that, uh, you know, you, you invested in it like a, like, like a kind of a uh, share, you know, so uh, you, you put your cryptocurrency. It's something which is very alien to me because it doesn't appeal to me at all. I'm somebody who's very old school. I like to have art which I can put my hands on to have it, you know, keep it in my house, uh, have a relationship with it. It's very different. But there are, there are people who enjoy the idea of owning uh, something which is uh, internationally, you know, uh, in demand and they wouldn't mind having a small share in that. And so they 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 spend uh, millions of rupees uh, investing in that, and they've got millions of rupees back. So I think that art online is something which is an unexplored market that we have in India are just discovering with the pandemic. Yeah, I I wish to share something here. The other day I was listening to uh, one of the senior managers of Christie's. And he was sharing that there is a lot of hunger for collectors to buy work now because there is time and there is, uh, I mean, uh, time to see work online. And it, it is because of technology, it's very easy to now see the quality of the work. But there is a challenge also in the same platform. They are not able to sort of um, use it to the fullest. Hmm. So do you think... Uh, uh, it would improve. Do you think we need to have some kind of orientation, uh, how to sort of use and what are the um, technologies, what are the platforms available for art by and sell? The Kuali, in fact, I think you can answer that question better than anybody of us because you've done that whole, uh, you know, technology where you can go into the 3D and all of that. So maybe you tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, I feel uh, that it will take a little time and I felt the necessity. That's why I wanted uh, some of you to sort of reflect and think that whether I'm thinking in the right direction, whether our orientation is in, uh, necessary for people who wish to or will have to 
eventually. Uh, yeah, I, I think that an orientation is totally necessary because, uh, you know, uh, there was there was Art Dubai where they tried to sort of put up the, the booths and they had you go there physically, you could go closer to the painting, you could go far away from the painting, you could go from one room to the other room. So they tried all of that online. Uh, it's of course not the same as, you know, doing it physically, but hey, you've got that so that that is that is one something to look forward to and i think that even the kiran other museum tried that with the uh, zarida hashmi exhibition where uh, you could go inside inside the room and have this sort of 3d kind of exp experience and uh, you know i think that even the 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 exhibitions which are coming up now are thinking about doing both physical as well as online because there are a lot of people who are not going to be able to travel or get get to certain places. The visas are not coming through. The, the planes are not flying. So you can't, you know, you can't really go there. So we will we will need this technology. I think that the pandemic is stretching out to be longer than what we had thought it would be. To answer your question. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, museum sort of rings a bell and I uh, was sort of having uh, a desire to know more about the Van Gogh Museum project that uh, um, uh, Azumi did as part of, was it the part of your corporate uh, sponsorship? Uh, yes, it's also part of my, yeah, uh, how can I say, uh, relationship with Van Gogh. Uh, I support and uh, kind of as an ambassador to the, you know, um, to promote and to support the museum. And also, like I help them uh, in the corporate uh, partnership relationship uh, between the museums, and then uh, also help them to make strategies and how, and also in the communication side. So then, uh, yes, uh, it was uh, 2020 was the kind of the the 10 years anniversary of this global uh, uh, sponsorship club, and then they were supposed to have the uh, like you know VIP uh, uh, corporate. Um, gathering party a reception uh, in Japan. So um, then, uh, uh, then yeah, we cannot travel, and then, so we cannot actually connect physically. Uh, you know, um, to bring these receptions, and also we were not. You know, nobody know when this pandemic will finish, so we could not actually postpone. So then uh, 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 that was earlier, like almost uh, one year ago, we were discussing about it. So I came up with an idea to create a video, uh, especially uh, towards this, uh, you know, uh, co corporate uh, sponsors and to the CEOs and executives. So then uh, uh, we did, and then uh, we were supposed to shoot in the museum, but somebody got Corona. And then uh, the day before the shooting, uh, we just said, oh, okay, we have the problem. Uh, somebody has the, uh, we cannot enter the museum. So we have to do it from home. So then everybody, like I was the master of ceremony and then uh, I, uh, uh, hosted the events and to present the, the director of the museum and uh, Willem Van Gogh, uh, who is the great grand nephew of Van, uh, Van Gogh himself. So then it, the, the idea was to strengthen, uh, it's not asking about a fund, it's not about asking about, you know, uh, yeah, please help. It was about strengthening uh, our friendship. Uh, with the museums and Van Gogh's work, through his work, and uh, to strengthen this global community uh, to support the artwork. And then Sunflower itself, the, uh, uh, Van Gogh actually wrote in his letter to Theo Van Gogh, his brother. Sunflower, the art itself is the consolatory for distressed hearts. It's also go back to the heart that I talked about. It's about the comforting, the, his sunflower, the painting of the sunflower was the comfort for this, for our distressed heart. So if you see the sunflower, it brings the light, you know, it brings a smile to everybody. It's really like the, the, uh, the, the symbol of light and hope. So I also came uh, and made a haiku, the Japanese poem, and in English say the sunflower light and hope, our friend. So through the sunflower, uh, we bring, uh, we share this light and hope 
uh, among our friends and the sunflower is really like our friend that when you see even in the street in a difficult time in the middle of darkness sunflower actually brighten up it's gold and yellow and i have gold background here <laughs> but uh, so that was the the uh, uh the, the kind of the core message that I wanted to bring in this uh, video, and then uh, I was honored to to present, of course, the the director and also the uh, um, uh, Willem van Gogh. And so, yes, uh, that's uh, there is a video. Uh, uh, we could we have the link of the video? We can post it so that uh, visitors can come and see. Yes. Yeah. If you can share the link uh, at the end of the. Emmy? Yes. Or we don't okay. we don't have time to see the video, Kweli. Uh, then uh, Azumi has to uh, decide which portion of the video because uh, it's quite a okay. long video and we do not have the time. Okay, so just, just one perhaps, minute. Yes, yes. Uh, Give uh, us a glimpse. Yeah, yeah, just a glimpse. Yes, just one second. It was not ready, so I have to go to my life. I have the video ready with me, Azumi, in case you okay. want okay. to share. Okay, you have the video? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe the last parts, and uh, you can also start from the beginning, but uh, uh, it's in Japanese. I, I think, think uh, uh, the introduction, it has got subtitles, so that beginning part is important, I think. Yes, yes. Yes. Beginning. I think the sound is off. <laughs> グローバルサークル10周年記念いたしまして、オランダよりこのビデオをお届けいたします。司会を務めさせていただきます。番号ホビスカン、The Konnichiwa, ladies and gentlemen, patrons of the Van Gogh Museum, Global Circle Japan, dear friends. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. It's a real honor and a great pleasure to have the opportunity to address you, although it's by video. On behalf of all of us here at the Van Gogh Museum Amsterdam, our very best wishes to all of you. These are hugely challenging times, and we really hope that you and your loved ones are in good health. Our thoughts go out to everyone in Japan who have been affected by this pandemic. COVID-19 has and continues to have a dramatic impact on our everyday lives and the world as we know it. As we navigate our way through the new normal of COVID-19, the uncertainty of this pandemic has challenged us to adapt be agile, and rethink much of our programs. As you know, the museum traditionally works together with our Japanese partners to organize a variety of activities in Japan. This year, we were specifically looking forward to the opening of the new Sompo Museum and of the exhibition Van Gogh Still Life from Tradition to Innovation in collaboration with our founding partner, Sompo Japan, and our patrons, NTV Europe, and Mr. Koji Miura. Unfortunately, the exhibition has been postponed. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Sompo Japan on the opening of the museum and to thank Mr. Nakajima-san, Mr. Murata-san, and Ms. Koshikawa-san, and Mr. Kawabata-san for all of their efforts in organizing the exhibition. And to thank Mr. Ishikawa-san for his dedication in recent years. Arigato gozaimasu. I was also looking forward personally to our annual Global Circle Japan reception in Tokyo, which would have been hosted at the new Sompo Museum. It would have been my first opportunity to meet all of you in person. And it would have been a very special occasion indeed. The Global Circle was founded in 2010 at the Dutch Embassy in Japan. So this year would have been the 10th anniversary of celebrating friendship between Japanese companies Dutch companies based in Japan, Japanese foundations, and the Van Gogh Museum. 
Back in Amsterdam, the Van Gogh Museum is doing its very best to deal with the new circumstances. Due to some, and it would have been a very special occasion indeed. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit long video, so uh, maybe I can share the link later. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> uh, at the end, in the uh, closing, uh, that was the uh, uh, the haiku that I shared, uh, and then I actually closed with the uh, this haiku mentioning the strengthening of the friendship and uh, and as a symbol of the sunflower. So. Um, Are we still sharing the video? Uh, yes, just one second, please. Yes. Well, I'd love you to see everything, but uh, you know, maybe later, if we still have time uh, to show the last part. We have the we have to open the house for the questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. A little bit of interaction. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube is kind of hanging up, but I have shared the video link on YouTube for all of our uh, audience. Ah, okay. okay, good. So Thank I think uh, yeah, because of the time is also, I think, running. Yes, out. that's right. Thank you. I think time did us good because uh, we've uh, sort of covered a lot of uh, topics, beginning from spices to museums, art selling. Uh, projects that happened during the pandemic, I think a huge um, chunk of uh, work and information has been shared and we've uh, had a very interesting uh, session together. May I open the house for questions from the viewers or if you, if the panelists wish to interact? Um, there have been one or two questions on YouTube. Uh, Koili, if you would like me to ask, then I can raise them on their behalf. Definitely, <laughs> Jyoti. That would be a wonderful help. Sure. Okay. So uh, Akshat Sinha uh, mentions that civil liberties have been trampled across the world. And um, he's asking if dictatorships which have been, you know, pertinent before, for example, in Myanmar, Belarus, Russia, etc., uh, have also been, um, you know, they were initiated sort of a thing from, from different parts of the world. And he's asking if art is also a form of activism. Subhashri, would you like to take the question? <laughs> yeah, that's my favorite question. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, uh, I'm working here with a group of uh, refugee women and also the peop uh, women of color. And my research is very much uh, uh, on this, how art can uh, provoke, art can uh, say a lot of things. And like, of course, uh, politics and art is a very big topic, uh, but uh, I think why I choose this because art has a way of saying uh, politics, talking to politics in a very non-violent way and also in a very compelling way. I mean, truth has to be told, but with art, we can say it in a very compelling way. So, and also I was showing the slides uh, about Extension Rebellion and they are actually uh, employing a lot of art, like uh, performative art and uh, clowning. Uh, and uh, also if you see their posters and stuff, it's, it's, there's lots of graphics in it and which is like a little old uh, uh, print uh, kind of thing. So there's, they are employing art and politics together as a form of activism. And uh, I mean, in Denmark, uh, is the whole uh, thing about uh, people of color talking and saying uh, uh, that we also ha have something to say in this society, something very new and which came with the 
lot of artists, uh, writer, they come up around 2017, uh, 18. It's very, very new. But there's a lot of artists doing uh, art activism. For example, Jeanetta Ayla um, and uh, uh, Leslie uh, Lee Brown. She's a writer. Uh, and she came up with a book called Decolonize. Exactly, I don't remember. I'll type it right, type it down. And this there's, there's Ayunim, who actually has to leave the country because she came, uh, she, she's a lesbian from Angola. Uh, and she came to Denmark because she got married to a, a Danish girl. But now they broke up, but she had to leave. So the Danish, the Scandinavian pen uh, took her case uh, and she is very much into art and activism. I mean, through his poem, through his art, uh, through his uh, spoken words, uh, she's very much into activism. So I work with a lot of people who are into art and activism, and especially this camp, uh, Center for Art and Migration uh, Politics. That's of course, uh, it's art and politics and activism combined. So of course, art is a form of activism. We have seen all the time. I mean, look at Picasso. Sharon, would you also like to respond to the question? Is art also activism? Well, for, for me, it is. Yes, that's a simple answer. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, it's a way. It's my way of changing the world. And I think I think um, for many artists. Um, it plays that role. A little um, more insight. Is there a layering? Is it always? Uh, is it sort of? Uh, is it layered? Does it? Uh, or you can separate the art from activism? Or are you even well, that's a very. I'm, I mean, that's, you know, in, in regard to my practice, it's the same, but that's not true for every artist. So, I, you know, there are people who in, make art about beauty or make art about different things. It's, 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 all, it's all legitimate um, and has its role. But for me, it, it, does, it does play a role of, uh, uh, it's how I think about changing the world or influencing the world. And then, of course, there's a long tradition of, of art that is political and and that um, that tries to do that. So, but there's a role for beauty as well. Right now, where I am, it's it, I just keep thinking about the the place I am right now. It, it's actually in North Carolina. It's very green, and the green is just intense, and that color is just it's it's amazing. And sometimes I just think about that beauty as well. But um, but most of my work has to do more with with political issues. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you so much, Sri. Uh, um, Koili, we do not. No, actually, we do not have a lot of questions, but we have a lot of beautiful comments on YouTube. It's filled. I request all the panelists to go on to our YouTube channel and uh, look them up yourselves. Many of them have complimented your work. Um, we ourselves from Goethe Centrum Hyderabad, and I speak on behalf of Amita, who is also here with us today. Uh, we we are very, very thankful, Koeli, for bringing this together, but also to all our panelists. What lovely ways of, um, you know, spreading uh, spreading a message to the world. Azumi, uh, Cheryl, Subhashri, and Georgina, you have floored us with thoughts. And I'm sure a lot of artists around the world, and um, luckily we are in this phase now where I can say around the world, I'm sure, I'm sure have been touched and inspired to do something more and not um, kind of limit themselves to uh, physical spaces or, or so, but just let thoughts flow. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. We do hope to keep in touch and probably, uh, you know, when times get better, also meet in a physical world somewhere and do a project together. It would be wonderful. All our viewers on YouTube, thank you for being with us. Yes, the session went Last on a little bit longer. Last but not the least, I request you to share Mahula's uh, work she, that she very kindly gave us to uh, yes. put on our uh, posters and publicity material. 
sure sure thank you thank you again koli i will i will share the work now um th and thank you for being with us yeah. It's titled The Fear Factor. And this has been showcased in Hyderabad Literary Festival's uh, Poons Matrix uh, exhibition mm -hmm. that is still up online. And it's, it's a group show and uh, it's of uh, artists trained from Shantini Ketan, titled as uh, The Continuous Dream. And I, I will be sharing all the links on YouTube for all the viewers out there. Please feel free to catch these exhibitions. All of these exhibitions for, for the Hyderabad Literary Festival have been curated by curators from across India. Koeli is one of them. We have Abir and Shruti Mahajan. We have had um, Ati Amjad and uh, also uh, Tanmay Santra. All of them have come together, curated exhibitions. They are available online. Please do take a look. Along with the current exhibition of Koeli, uh, which is called Cooking Up a Storm, Her Sir John. And these links will be shared on YouTube. Please feel free to catch them, including our next exhibition, which is coming up in a, in a week's time, um, called, uh, you know, it's related to backyard stories. Thank you so much.